I'm really proud of my career trajectory, honestly, even though I did hop around a lot. Everything that I did and every, every time I left was for something different and for an opportunity that kept helping me grow. Hello and welcome to Proud to Be You, the alumni podcast from Boston University. I am your host, Jeff Murphy. Thank you so much for tuning in. If you like what you're hearing on Proud to Be You, I'll ask that you please take just two minutes and sign up for our newsletter for bonus content and giveaways. You can do that now on the web at bu.edu slash proud to be you. My guest today is Saba Hamidi, a common CAS grad from 2013, who's now the culture and trends editor for NBC News. Saba joined me to talk about her dynamic career in journalism at outlets such as the LA Times, Huffington Post, and CNN and how she honed her craft early on as the editor-in-chief of BU's own Daily Free Press. Proud to Be You showcases the journeys of some of Boston University's most interesting and accomplished alumni. Inspiring grads share the highs, the lows, and the challenges they've overcome along the way from come out to innovative careers. No matter where your path takes you, be proud to be you. Saba, thanks so much for joining us on the Proud to Be You podcast. Thanks so much for having me. I'm excited to be here. I was wondering if you just get us started by telling our listeners what your current role is, the organization that you work for and what you're doing for, for a job. Sure. I'm coming to you live from NBC News's LA office. Um, I'm the culture and trends editor here for NBC News Digital. So what that means is I edit stories related to all things culture and trends. So I was thinking about that before we were coming on today. Sure, you're an editor at a, at a major news organization, but I'm wondering, you know, if you were to try to explain that in a little bit more detail to folks that might be just completely unfamiliar with the idea. Um, and, and what do you think people might misunderstand about what your role is at a, you know, a, a major name like NBC News? Oh, yeah, absolutely. So editing is basically um, a little bit of management, a little bit of copy editing, um, and a lot of like organization and um, sort of being on top of everything, making sure that what we're producing is high enough bar for NBC. And so what that means is basically I start my day looking through, you know, stuff that we might want to write about um, that I can assign to my team of, I have three reporters. Um, I also, it also means sometimes news hits and I assign that. So it's a mix of things happening that I am reacting to and things that I'm being proactive about. And also um, um, my reporters pitch stories that I sign off on that they work on and I also edit. And so what that means is they do the reporting, um, they they do the process, they interview folks, they uh, write a story, they put together a headline and, um, you know, sort of like the framework of the story that we had discussed in the early process. And then when they file it to me, I edit it and then I go through it with them. Um, sometimes it goes back to them to do more reporting. Sometimes it goes back to them to do a second edit on their end. And then other times it's good to go, especially with breaking news type stories, you have to be fast. So uh, then that goes right to the site or it goes to our lovely copy desk where they do one more edit to make sure everything looks good. Um, Part of that job also means making sure um, I coordinate with other editors as well. So I coordinate with the photo desk. I coordinate sometimes with the video team. I also coordinate with our platforms team who helps us with headlines and sharpening that. And they also are the ones who send out alerts that you get on your phone. So it's a lot of coordination uh, and a lot of work across teams to make that final product shine. You mentioned earlier this idea of being the balance of proactive and reactive. Mm -hmm. And I, I was just thinking about, you know, your quality of life. I'm guessing maybe in culture at the culture and trends desk, maybe it's a little bit more manageable, but there's still breaking news under under your desk. So how any given week, are you able to sort of make your own schedule or are you just constantly on call to respond when news hits? Um, I think, you know, it really depends. I think anyone who's in journalism sort of knows that your life um is sometimes dictated by what's going on. Um, and some, you know, obviously I work at a really great place and there's a lot of flexibility in terms of like, you know, like I'm doing this podcast in the middle of the day, which is lovely. And they, you know, are giving me that time or, you know, everybody has life besides work. Um, so I think that 
you know, you don't let it dominate how you live, um, but you do oftentimes adjust your schedule to accommodate what you're working on because it is that demanding. My colleagues who have been covering the um, Gaza, Hamas, Israel war since October 7th attack um, in Israel, they have been working tirelessly for months. Um, and in the beginning, of course, it was around the clock and now it's a little bit dialed back, but it ramps up every so often. So, you know, like things like that are very demanding or the bridge collapse recently, um, you know, in Maryland, it, it's those types of things. You sort of just like drop what you're doing to try and help um, if you can. Um, and like you said, culture is a little bit slower paced, but that doesn't mean that we don't have our moments. And my team, what they do a really good job of is sort of being um, able to assist in terms of those breaking stories, because there's always some kind of angle that we can help with. So I think even though we have slower, maybe day to day, because sometimes things are less pressing um, or less of a, we need to do an alert ASAP type story, um, they still are demanding or we are meeting the newsroom's need for help on other stuff. And even after I asked you that question, I was thinking to myself, well, <laughs> so much of news is now immediate if you, if you anyway i want to rewind the clock on you a little bit um you mentioned that you're in la i think you were born and raised in los angeles right yes, i am yeah i'm a born and raised in la i grew up in santa monica and now i live in the valley um so and did you grow up with dreams of being a reporter what did you what do you remember wanting to do when you were maybe in you know middle school high school yeah, I, I kind of always wanted to be a journalist. Um, I joined the paper as a freshman in high school, which was rare because it was usually sophomores through seniors, but they had an opening second semester. Um, they like did an open call, which they never did after that. I don't know if it's because <laughs> I ruined it for them or something, but I basically switched in um, as a freshman second semester and I was like the youngest one on the paper, but um, I was pretty hooked since then. But even before then, when I was a kid, I like made my own little newspaper. <laughs> so I've always had um, a love of journalism. And Christiane Amanpour at CNN is um, an Iranian journalist who, you know, I've long admired as well. So I kind of always knew that this was something for me. I In high school, I also was editor in chief of the paper. And I went to a high school journalism workshop that I still teach at every summer. Um, it's a two-week nonprofit program. It's called CSPA. Um, and so I did that. And that sort of solidified that I also wanted to do it in college because it's kind of a preview to what college would be like. We lived in dorms. We did journalism for two weeks, like journalism classes um, for two weeks straight. And it was all these other journalism nerds. And I was like, oh, I definitely think I want to go into a journalism program um, for college. So I knew that I loved journalism and then I did that the CSPA program in high school and then I knew I wanted to major in it. So that's when I focused senior year to, you know, look at schools that had programs specifically to apply to. And BU, obviously, incredible journalism program, history to journal journalism program here. Yeah. Is, is that what brought you to Boston all the way from California or how did, how did you end yes. up at BU? I actually still remember this. Um, BU was my top school um, because I went to an information session in LA and I remember the person who spoke, he wasn't even a journalism major. He was an IR major, but he was like talking about how he got to study abroad like four times and how he interned for like the Clinton foundation and also at the white house. And I was like, how cool is that? And I just remember being sold on just that BU experience, being able to do so many different things and um, have all those opportunities. And in fact, I did study abroad twice while I was at BU. So <laughs> I utilized. You, I definitely want to ask you about that. Yeah, I, I utilized the, utilize the abroad program um, very much so. So um, yeah, I, I remember being sold on that. And I remember seeing that they had a journalism program that was really strong and I was really excited about it. And then just to give a shout out to another BU alum, when I was admitted, I went to like an admitted student. I don't know if it was an admitted student's day, um, but I got to shadow a freshman in Calm. Uh, at the time, she was a freshman, Katie Lannon, who is now still in journalism um, and still in the Boston area covering the State House. But I got to shadow Katie Lannon and I went to a Calm 101 class, I think. 
taught by Chris Daly, who has since retired, but was is one of my favorite professors to this day. Um, and I was I was sold. Oh, and we had lunch at Warren Towers. Um, it was just the best day ever. And I was like, I have to go here. Um, and I got really lucky. I think it was like March, but uh, not snowing and like really perfect day in Boston. And I was like, wow, seasons. But I didn't know that it had <laughs> snowed like a week before. So I, I fell in love with Boston and I fell in love with BU and um, yeah. had a really, it, it was a great, and I got in, so it all worked out. It seems um, sometimes kind of immaterial to the conversation, but I just can't help but take an opportunity to ask you about your life at BU outside of class and outside of what, you know, I'll, I'll ask you about the press work that you were doing but tell me about your life where were you living on campus if if i were looking for you studying on a sunday night where would i have found you where were you what were you doing on the weekend oh, i i love talking about my bu life um most of my bu friends would tell me like i was queen of like being obsessed with 11c the uh calm co-ed floor i lived on freshman year in warren towers uh, shout out to 11C, who I will most certainly be sending this podcast to episode two. <laughs> but um, I met some of my best friends on that floor. Um, and it was just such a fun time. Um, of course, everyone was in calm. So that was part of the experience that made it special. But one of our um, floor mates, um, Conrad, he would ho he would like organize movie nights. So we would all go out to the movies. Uh, he was a film major. And one of our other floor mates would organize uh, viewing parties of the show Lost, which was airing at the time that we were all in college. One of my other floor mates and close friend Sneha, she would host like crafting stuff. So the common room always looked like really lovely. Like, we had all these like Valentine's up one for Valentine's Day. So um, freshman year, you could definitely find me on 11C doing whatever 11C was doing. <laughs> so I was mostly hanging out with them if I wasn't at the paper or in class. Um in terms of studying, I think by senior year, I lived in Stuby too, which uh, was my dream since I was a freshman. And that study lounge is has some of the best views in, views in Boston. And I lived there for a lot of my studying time. I would sometimes study from like midnight until sunrise and just watch the sunrise in, in that study lounge. Um, sorry to my parents listening to this who are, you know, they're like, wow, you don't sleep. It started there when I didn't sleep. Um, I would just be studying in that study lounge. Um, that was probably the two, the, the space that I like to study at most. And um, I must give a shout out to the GSU, where I also often did a lot of work and ate a lot of loose leaf salads and Starbucks. So those are my, that's where you would find me on campus. That's great. So. So we have to talk about this. You, you know, you've now had this career in journalism. You, I mean, you started in newspapers, as you said, in high school, but you were the editor in chief of the Daily Free Press. Yes. Uh, I can only imagine how difficult it was to manage that involvement with classwork, trying to live your life as a college student. How did you make that all work? Well, I think anyone who were, has worked at the Daily Free Press and has certainly been an editor at the Daily Free Press wears it as a badge of honor, I have to say. Even, you know, a decade plus later, I still think of my time there as like my my boot camp for life. Um, actually, I think managing life can sometimes be easier than it was <laughs> managing being on the paper and, and class and stuff because uh, the way it would work is we would work after our classes like basically we would go to class and then we would meet in the newsroom we would plan for the next day we would you know the articles that were going to run in next day's paper we would edit all night and then um, we would send the paper to press and then do it all over again for four nights in a row and um yeah that meant like being a student and working so you know once i was a non-student and it, working full-time in a job of course Work is hard. Everyone will tell you it's not, you know, work and life are hard to manage. But I think being a student working uh, at the paper and then also balancing class was sort of a preview to like how to balance life um, and deadlines and and managing people, which I do now. But I did then. And um, back then it was my peers as well, you know, people who I, you know, was friends with and things like that. So I think the hardest part was probably because I double majored. So in comm, I was very grateful to my professors. They generally knew that if you were on the freep, you were basically living and breathing the newspaper. And so, you know, if like 
one day you were late, it was probably because you overslept from working all night at the newspaper. But uh, I did double major. So I think the hard part for me was getting um, those classes sort of um, prioritized a bit, uh, which meant a lot of gen eds, but also a lot of poli sci classes, which are dense readings and dense paper writing. And um, I think it made my college experience way more well-rounded. I loved double majoring. I'm very proud that I have a dual degree. Um, but yeah, I think that was probably the hardest part because it would be it with calm. I wrote articles at the Freep and I wrote articles for class and I wanted to write articles for a living. Right. So I knew that the things that I was doing that in, in class were partially what I was going to be doing in my job eventually. And then in poli sci, of course, many things I learned in CAS, I still keep, you know, I, my knowledge that I have from my poli sci degree is still extremely handy. And I, you know, we'll get into this later. I'm sure I did end up covering politics briefly um, for two years in DC. So I I never regretted it, but it was just, it was harder for me to uh, think about it long-term because I was like, oh, but I'm not even going to go into politics, right? Or I'm not even going to become a political science professor. So that became the hard part, I think, just balancing the the dual degree. And, and that was, I'm so sorry that I even forgot to mention that in, the, in addition to the, all the things you're yeah. talking about, you walked out of here with, with a dual degree program. Yeah. Um, but the other thing you mentioned is you also took advantage of two of the BU semester abroad internship programs. I'm yeah. curious to hear about how that experience informed your, your later career trajectory. For sure. I mean, I don't know. I know you have a very uh, broad audience of current students and alums, but I think if you're a current student, I cannot recommend study abroad enough. Um, truly the best experience I, I had in college in addition to the newspaper was studying abroad. So what ended up happening was BU has amazing abroad programs, kind of tough to choose from. Honestly, there's so many excellent opportunities and so many cool destinations that you could go live from for four or five months, take classes, immerse yourself, really amazing. But of course, we speak English, uh, being from the United States, and I was a journalism dual major, so I knew that I wanted to probably go somewhere where I can intern and BU London via Com. Well, BU London generally has a very strong internship placement program, and also London is just amazing and wonderful city, and I still love it so much. So, um, I knew I wanted to do an internship, so I knew kind of London was the spot that I wanted to be. And I applied to the program and I got placed at a travel writing internship, which was very different for me, but I, I also really enjoyed it. And I still got to knock out um, a poli sci class while I was there because I took a political science class um, while I was abroad. And um, as in addition to a journalism internship in class. And so that was truly wonderful. Basically, it's everything you would have ever thought and more. You take class in um, you know, overseas, you meet other people from BU who you hadn't met before, but also people from other schools who know how good BU's abroad programs are, um, and they're in them. So you meet a bunch of different types of people. You meet um, people at your internship. So I loved interacting with so many different types of people. I loved immersing myself in a new city, and I loved getting that uh, different experience writing-wise. Um, travel writing was very different for me. Um, and then I couldn't get enough. So <laughs> after that, I did the summer in Washington, D.C. in BU's D.C. program, which I'm not sure if BU still does it um, full time or not. I think it was like a semester by semester basis. Um, but that was a wonderful experience as well, because it kind of felt like we were like real world Washington, D.C., because there was about 15 of us only. It was a very small group for the summer. Um, and we lived in this lovely um, building in Woodley Park area near the zoo and and next to a Starbucks and next to a McDonald's. And um, it was just a really fun time. And everybody was really, really, really immersed in politics. And so it was a different experience for me in that sense, because every day we would have conversations about politics. It was just for fun. Like it was fun. Um, certainly a very, you know, and we would put like CNN and Fox and NBC News on like on rotation depending on who had control over the remote, uh, depending on what we were talking about that evening. But that was a super fun summer. And I 
covered um, Massachusetts and New Hampshire politics for a variety of papers, like kind of their news service while I was there. So my focus was like following around um, Massachusetts elected officials and New Hampshire elected officials um, and pitching and doing sort of news stories around politics there. So that was also amazing. Um, yeah. And it was a preview to DC life, which I can get to later as well. Uh, so. But first, I mean, not a couple months after graduation, you land your gig as a reporter for the LA Times. I have to assume that's like the dream of any calm journalism student. Did you feel <laughs> like that was your big break into, into the world of journalism? Yes, it was honestly surreal. I, um, I interned every summer, but I had smaller internships for sure. I interned at the Christian Science Monitor while I was in Boston, which is, you know, in the city. So that was one of my internships. I did the, um, I was a newswire service from DC. So I had really strong political clips from there. Um, and then I had the summer after college, I interned at the Arizona Republic, which is a Gannett newspaper and it's in Phoenix. And so I was on the business desk there. So I had like a wide variety of internship experiences. Oh, also a hyper local internship experience at the Santa Monica mirror, um, the local paper here. So I had a little bit of everything, but it certainly, you know, I, I always felt like, I was like, I don't know if it's good enough. Right. But there's, this amazing fellowship at the LA Times. Um, it used to be called MetPro. Now I think it's just called their fellowship program. But um, you know, it was it's it's very competitive and it was hard to get into. But I I knew one of my journalism workshop friends. I mentioned the high school journalism workshop. She was um, my counselor when I was a student, and she worked went to USC and she worked at the LA Times and she got the job at the LA Times through the fellowship that she did. And she's still my, one of my close friends to this day. But she told me, she was like, you should apply. You should do it. It's like, you know, once in a lifetime opportunity to do it. And it's great exposure. And so I went through the application process. And while I was finishing up my internship in Arizona, I got offered the opportunity. And the way it works is it's two years. You rotate different desks. And then you get placed on a desk where they sort of like think you fit best or you sort of express that you want to be on. And that's where I ended up covering entertainment and the business of entertainment. So I definitely think of it as a huge opportunity still. Um, I'm And I'm still a huge fan of the LA Times. It's like my home paper. And it was a dream. I mean, it was a dream. I, you know, in high school, I, I read the LA Times and Steve Lopez, the columnist came to speak to our, you know, our high school and about his book, The Soloist. So I just, I just couldn't believe it. And then I met so many of my good friends there and so many mentors as well. It just, I was sitting next to people who blew my mind every day. So that's how I learned a lot. Um, honestly, just listening to their calls, um, learning how they sourced in Hollywood, um, them telling me who I should meet with. I, I had like, again, another boot camp experience, but this time at a, a top paper and it was amazing. Um, I think my first like really, really big story covering entertainment was at the LA Times, um, covering the Sony hack. So that was obviously one of the craziest <laughs> stories that to this day, I think, um, you know, the movie, a Seth Rogen movie, <laughs> James Franco yep. movie, a yeah. North Korea hack. It just had every element. It had entertainment, tech, politics, which are also all three of my areas now. So it's kind of funny because it, it did sort of set like, I guess it foreshadowed what I do sort of now, honestly, navigate sure. those three worlds of it. With hundreds of thousands of BU alumni, you're never far from the BU community. Find alumni networks for our most populous regions on BU's exclusive networking platform, BU Connects, and be the first to know about in-person events in cities across the U.S. Sign up at buconnects.com and click Groups and Networks to find and join your local network. So we're only 10, 11 years since graduation, and one thing that I thought was really interesting about your career is that you've, you've moved around quite a bit. I have different coasts, traditional sort of like print media, uh, digital first media, and different organizations and different kinds of desks. You talked about your political experience with CNN. Can you give us kind of like the guideline 
overview tour of the last 10 yeah. years of your life and why you how you made the decisions to to navigate those different positions and opportunities. Yeah, I'm really proud of my career trajectory honestly even though I did hop around a lot. Everything that I did and every re every time I left was for something different and for an opportunity that kept helping me grow. Like I never felt stagnant in my career because I was at LA Times which, you know, honestly I probably could have stayed at the LA Times forever because I just love the LA Times. I loved my my colleagues. I love the paper still. But I was sort of presented with this opportunity. I was covering VidCon, this conference out of LA, where um, these creators and, and young influencers are. And at the time, it was like a newer space. Like YouTube was not new, but it was just, just booming and, and people didn't really understand it yet. Kind of like TikTok two years ago, right? Like it sort of was, that's what YouTube was like back then. It was like alive and vibrant and it still is by the way, but back then it was like early and new. Um, and I was, I was sort of into this space and I was 22 and I was someone who understood it, right? Like in college, I watched YouTube videos and a lot of people didn't yet, right? It was, a, it was an untapped world. Um, but I went to VidCon for the paper and I was covering it. It was super fun. And that's where I met, um, my one of my old editors at Mashable and also my current boss Jason at NBC was also at VidCon covering it for Mashable which is very funny it was exactly it was exactly 10 years ago and was it 2014 yeah 20 maybe it was 2015 VidCon so maybe nine years ago but um I was there and this editor Josh Dickey he approached me and and was talking to me about how he's trying to build out an entertainment team even more in LA for this website, Mashable. And which was, you know, at the time also a very big rival of BuzzFeed. And this is when digital media was booming, extremely hot and really cool. And, um, you know, he offered me a job and I was like, I kind of have to take this, right? Like it was, you know, and also my fellowship was two years and sort of winding down plus, um, there was no guarantee of getting hired at the LA Times. They could continue to extend my contract, but you know, I wasn't sure what would come you know, next or when there might I you know, I'm confident hopefully I would have gotten hired, but I had this job just like in front of me at this really cool place that was very much at the forefront of covering a beat that I started getting interested in, which was the digital entertainment space. And so I took the job and I worked there um and it was amazing. It was the best. It was so much experience, so much exposure to beat reporting, to covering content, um, you know, new content, but also traditional Hollywood content. And then it was a mix of doing so many different types of things, like writing articles, of course, but making Facebook live videos, which at the time Facebook was encouraging news outlets to make live videos and striking deals with media outlets. They don't do that anymore. Um, but Making, I had a Facebook Live show at a time. Um, uh, what else? Did it, Snapchat videos. So many fun things that I just got to do as part of my day to day, um, and moderating panels. It just was an amazing exposure as a young journalist, and just amazing opportunities. And I really loved it. That said, um, as we all know, 2016 sort of changed the the entire landscape as we know it in the world as we know it with the election. And I kept thinking like, you know, I never gave political reporting a chance, even though I did the DC summer program and I wanted to do political reporting. And even though I had a double major in poli sci and as the, after the election happened, I just was like, it's kind of now or never because I was, I was 24. No, I just turned 25. And I was like, if I don't move to DC now to give it a shot. I'll never do it. And I'll always wonder about political journalism and, and the path I never took. Right. So I started shifting gears and applying to jobs that would bring me back towards political journalism in DC. And I had an LA Times mentor who was at CNN, uh, Mitra Kalita, who told me to apply for a breaking news job um, at CNN in the DC Bureau on the digital side. And I was offered the job and I took it. I was, I was really nervous. It was obviously complete 
complete change of from what I was doing, but I knew I was like, if I don't like it, I can always leave. Or, you know, if I find myself loving it even more than, you know, I'll stay in DC. You know, I basically was like, and I knew I liked DC as a city because I did abroad. So I did it. I made the leap. I moved to DC. I worked for CNN for almost two years um, out of their DC bureau. And honestly, I, I learned so much, but I burnt out very fast. Mm. It just is, was a rapid pace. I mean, at that time, um, and also being on the breaking news team for politics there, it literally was like any time President Trump would tweet something, we had to we would write it. And like that that news cycle was um was so rapid fire for me that I it was and I was also removed from like I, I, I was like, maybe I would have liked being a political reporter more in l a, right? Because I was home, you know, so if there was like a grind, I had like family and friends nearby. but it was it was tough for me to be both away from my community at home and in this like grind. I really was, again, I'm proud of all the work I did there. I, I covered the Supreme Court um, travel ban hearing. I covered the Women's March in Las Vegas. I covered um, a Trump rally in Arizona because they sent me back since I had interned in Arizona. Um, so there were a lot of amazing opportunities and obviously CNN is a truly amazing place to work. Another dream for me to, have done. Um, but I, I knew after two years, I, I knew it wasn't for me anymore to be there. So, and I also started thinking about a new career in terms of what I want to do day to day, because I had just been in this fast paced grind and I started thinking about editing again because of the daily free press. Mm -hmm. So I was like, I, I miss, you know, I really think that that might be the next thing I want to do. I just never thought I could do it so young. Um, I never thought it would be an opportunity presented to me. Um, but then I got this job at HuffPost on the news desk where I would be editing out of LA and I, I took it and I worked night hours, but, uh, from LA, it was about one to nine and Sunday to Thursday. And I also learned so much in Huffington Post. I just, all the people there are also wonderful. I know I keep saying all these people are amazing, but I am where I am because I've had so many wonderful colleagues who have helped elevate me and taught me so much. And, um, some of my HuffPost colleagues now work at NBC also, so I get to hang out with them again. But um, basically, I did some editing there, but I left because CNN had an LA editor job for me. And then it was supposed to be focused on West Coast news. Like, I, it was kind of like, oh, come work in our LA bureau and, you know, help edit news stories and, and whatnot. And um, but then COVID happened. So my job editing turned into editing a lot of COVID stories and a lot of, um, you know, racial justice movements. And it was, um, then I burnt out again, <laughs> if I'm being mm -hmm. honest, I burnt out once again. Um, I think everybody did during the pandemic, yeah. but <laughs> yes, nothing new here. Everybody sort of felt that grind and, um, but it was just reminiscent of DC in the sense that I was like, no wait, I came back to LA to not be on that grind a little bit, you know, not that I, I, I really like working hard. So I just need to put that on the record. But I think, um, what I mean by grind was it would be like some days I would edit 12 stories. 12. Like that is insane. Yeah. You know, yeah. but, and I, I, and also we were all so stuck at home. Right. So there was no divides between work and life. Yeah. And so, you know, like there is no excuse to like really sign off. So I'd be like, yeah, of course I can finish that story because I wanted to. And because I had nothing else to do. <laughs> Like, I was like, sure, I'll, I'm happy to help with this. Well, that's what I'm saying. I'm not trying to like diminish your experience of burning out, but, um, you know, the, we, we end up talking a lot on the show about this work, li this idea of work life harmony. Yeah. Maybe we don't call it balance, but we call it harmony. And that became so difficult for so many during that time. But yeah. Um, so basically, also in an industry where I, I have to assume so, so many people are burning out. Yes. Yeah. So, you know, I, I became another journalist who was like, wow, is this what I want to be doing? And so I had another moment where I was like, you know, thinking about my future and I really, really, really missed culture. And I was back in L.A. And you know what made me miss culture journalism was because culture became my escapism during COVID, like so many other people. So I was watching all, I was rewatching so many of my favorite shows, but I was also like clinging on to the, the last things that were new that year that had been greenlit to come out. And I was like, you know, this is why I also loved entertainment reporting because it was my escape. And, um, you know, I just felt like I wanted to return to that journalistically. I just was like, I want to go back to culture because, 
you know, it during COVID, especially I was like, this was what I leaned on for escape and maybe I should return to it in terms of work as well. So I started looking for opportunities related to culture. And this is where, again, my amazing colleagues, present and former, always come back um, to have my back. And my current boss, Jason, um, he and I were talking, we have been talking since we worked at Mashable together. We always have been talking online. We've been friends for a long time. And I, you know, I was telling him about CNN and sort of, I was like, you know, I'm feeling a little burnt out like everybody else um, covering COVID and and all this other stuff that's I'm taking a toll, sort of trying to figure it out. And I, I want to go back to culture, you know, like my Mashable times. And he was telling me, you know, NBC is trying to build a trending team and desk. And so he connected me with um, one of the top editors here. And um, I ended up applying for this job and I got it. And I've been here ever since. And it's almost three years. And now I actually report to Jason, which is hilarious because he he's the reason I work here. Um and he's very much a champion of me, and I, I I can't thank him enough. So now I know when he's giving me feedback where it comes from. I mean, he, you know, sure. I mean, I I, I what I hear this story a lot, right? Like you're you're I think maybe not giving give, not giving yourself enough credit. A, it sounds like you've been very blessed to have some colleagues that you really click with, particularly in a, in a complicated industry. But you've managed those relationships in a way that have turned into a network that help you, you know, continue to to move into the kinds of work that you want to do. I know you told me that you also have a number of BU alumni that you're working with now. I'm curious, particularly yeah. in LA, right? We have, it's like our number three alumni, maybe three or four, I can't remember, but tons of BU folks living in the LA area. Has that BU journalism network been a part of your career story too? Yeah, definitely. I mean, actually, Jason went to BU also, but right. <laughs> he and I, yeah, he and I didn't overlap. Um, but you know, we we talk a lot about BU, our BU days and um, the Freep and things like that. And um, one of my direct reports, Angela, went to BU. She was a Freep editor as well. Um, but in in addition to that, yeah, the network out here is vast. I I try to go to as many BU uh, events as possible out here. I think there's certainly more um, entertainment folks in LA than journalism, but that's, you know, I'm in the entertainment space. Lines up pretty well with yeah, your It's actually amazing. And um, because I feel like, um, you know, I feel like being a terrier, you can sort of, it is a smaller community in LA than like USC or UCLA. So I think that when you meet a terrier, you get really excited because <laughs> you're like, oh, me too. You know, we did, we did the Boston thing and we came back and we didn't have football, but yeah, like, you know, because USC and UCLA have a huge rivalry here. So, um, but yeah, I mean, it's come, it's been really um, nice. One of my best friends, Elizabeth Rich was on the BU alumni council. Uh, I know I mentioned her to you and um, she's works in entertainment and she's ho hosted a ton of events out here as well. So it's been cool to sort of build on my existing community. A lot of my 11C friends also lived out here for a while or or still do. So um, yeah, it's just nice. It's it's um it's a big community. Yeah. We're I, I you've been great in giving us some time and I, I want to be respectful of getting you out of here, but I do have a couple other things I want to ask you about. One is uh, along the way and this is so I'm realizing this is a theme for you. In addition to having a full-time job, you've also been te serving as an adjunct professor at USC, teaching yeah. upcoming journalism students. And I'm I'm thinking about this. You know, you're talking about all the ways that you you've almost been like on the cusp of these emerging technologies that are having such an incredible impact on people's view of journalism and what the value of traditional media is today as so many people are getting their news from someplace like TikTok. What are you teaching the next generation? What, what's your advice to folks that are interested in, in a career in telling these stories, reporting the facts, but leveraging technology to do it? How do we continue to have trust in our institutions? I, I've got like 80 million questions I want to ask <laughs> you there in one, but what are some of your thoughts on that? Oh, yeah. I mean, this could be a whole separate podcast episode, really. <laughs> but honestly, teaching is one of the best things that I get to do. I love doing it at USC. And I also teach at the summer workshop that I mentioned. Um, and I think the same, I send the same message, or at least I try to. I never try to discourage people from entering this profession just because of how tumultuous it is. You know, there I, I never sugarcoat. Um, you know, the reality is it is tough to break in. 
but I always try and encourage because if you love something enough, it's a hundred percent worth it. One and two, we need good journalists. And so I think that what I like to teach is the, the education that you're getting is building a foundation for, if you go into journalism, being a strong reporter who still relies on those, those, the foundation, which is accuracy and, um, you know, strong communication skills. So I think even if you don't go into journalism, you still want those skills. Um, people still value those skills, but I try and emphasize like, this is a profession. It's an, it's a noble profession. It's an important profession and we need people to, uh, care and invest in media literacy and also just media and, um, being a, an advocate of like, how you can tell better stories, even if it is on TikTok. Like I'm not, you know, I love TikTok. We, you know, I think it can be an amazing place to um, get news out there. I mean, our NBC TikTok um, social video team has an amazing TikTok presence. Um, I think they're actually nominated for a Webby. Um, I think that news came out today, but you know, like it's a very strong tool, a very effective way to reach people. Um, Just as YouTube was, it was and is as well. You know, with that, of course, comes misinformation. Every platform, there's a fear of misinformation right now. Um, but that means it's even more important to have a journalism education um, because otherwise you're going to be the one spreading misinformation, whether that's on accident or not. You know, what you tweet, what you share, everything pe that people see, like if you're sharing something wrong, believe it or not, someone is seeing it. You might even have like only 10 followers, but those 10 people saw it and they might believe that it's true. So I think that I tell them too, like no matter what medium you want to pursue, you don't want to be the person who's saying the wrong information. You want to, even if it's, again, even if you're providing analysis, like where is that analysis rooted? Knowledge, reporting, facts. And similarly, um, on TikTok, a lot of the people that you see that are so great at um, news gathering, I, I love, you know, like I love under the desk news um, I love so many people who have created brands for themselves by, um, sharing news on TikTok. And in fact, because of that have also been invited to like the white house and such to, um, get more information out there, but you know, they all also cite us and CNN and New York times and LA times and local outlets because they were, they are making information digestible for an audience that doesn't necessarily read the articles, right. Which is a, a skill in itself. But at the same time, that skill that they have is rooted in journalism foundations that we have. So you want to be the one who can um, be able to sift through misinformation and put the facts out there for people to um, digest themselves and, you know, and, and be correct. So. Yeah. So I'm curious. Um, I think it, you're, I don't want to call you a rarity, but the folks that it's not unusual for folks to come to Boston University and then graduate and take a different path. And you've pretty much stayed on this journalism path since high school. If you could go back in time and talk to Saba when she was the editor uh, in chief of the Daily Free Press or even the editor of the school paper in high school, um, what would you tell her? And do you think you might have still navigated that path? Are you just incredibly happy with the work that you're doing? Yeah, I mean, I am really proud of my career. I am really proud of everything I've accomplished. And I'm I'm so grateful to have a job right now in this tough time for media. And I'm so grateful that I get to do my job every day. I, you know, everybody has tough days. And like I said, work is work. It's not meant to be like not work. It's called work for a reason. Um, and as I grow older, certainly I I value my personal time a lot more. I think that that's something that Maybe I would have told young Saba, like, yes, you know, raw, raw journalism, but also like live your life. <laughs> so I think that it took me a little too long to figure that out. Uh, I think a lot of people take some time to figure that out. Um, I'm not alone, of course. And um, but I think I would encourage young Saba and other young journalists who are aspiring to pursue this field to just, you know, know that like work is so important and you should care about it and you should like it because it is a large part of your day, um, but that you should carve out time for yourself as well. So I think that's something I would have, I don't know if high school Saba would have listened to that um, <laughs> if we're being honest, but I, you know, let alone college Saba who like lived at the newspaper office half the time. But I, I think that um, 
you know, I think having a fulfilling life outside of your job is equally as important as having a job that you fulfills you. I think that's awesome advice and a great place for us to wrap this up. Uh, I really thank you for your time and, and for sharing some of the experiences that you've had with our listeners. And it was, it was great to get to know you a little bit, Saba. Thank you. Yeah, Thank you so much for having me and for having this podcast and for, um, you know, helping other BU people navigate their day to day in their future careers and stuff like that. I think it's a wonderful, um, pod. So, and I also think that people, you know, I, I, it, podcasts had just started blowing up when I was at BU. I think serial began back then. Um, but I wish I had, I, you know, I wish I had it when I was in college to listen to all these wonderful guests you guys have. So. Well, that's, that's great. Thank you for saying that. And and maybe someday I'll be tuning into one of your podcasts if things keep going the way that, uh, that I, I feel like they do for journalists and entertainers. Okay, I'm sure, you, I'm sure you get this a lot, Jeff. And maybe you think this sometimes when you're listening to yourself, but I, it's hard to listen to your own voice. So I don't know about me and my podcast future. Amen, Saba. Thank you for saying that. <laughs> <laughs> have, have a great rest of your day, you guys. And, um, Same to you. Thanks a lot. Yeah. My thanks again to Saba for joining me on the podcast and sharing her perspectives on the evolution of the journalism field. Hopefully someday we'll have Saba back at BU to teach the next generation of calm journalists. If you heard something today that makes you proud to be you, I hope you'll join me in donating to the cause that means the most to you at bu.edu slash give. Thanks for listening to Proud to Be You. If you enjoyed this episode, please be sure to subscribe, rate, and review our podcast on YouTube, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you find your episodes. Proud to Be You podcast is produced by Boston University and our partners, Five Tool Productions, a BU alumni-owned, Boston-based company specializing in video production, live streaming, and content marketing. Our theme from Artist.io is Think About Lights by Ben Fox. All additional media in this episode has been shared by our guest. To learn more about Proud to Be You, visit bu.edu slash proud to be you.